Let's close the shutter. Okay, thank you for coming here or joining online. Today, we are going to share Master Odrifo Oka's, one of his early lectures in 1989, I suppose. It was in Nagoya, in Tokyo, Japan. Okay, the new development of success theory. Okay. Uh, Master Rifo Okawa started happy science about 37 years ago. And the teaching of happy science is consists of four pillars, which are love, wisdom, self-reflection, and progress. Love, wisdom, self-reflection, and progress. And today's teaching is mainly about progress, about progress, okay. Uh, okay, uh, today's content, you start from the starting point of success theory, the important, most important basic, he tell, tell, tells us, and then success as an individual, success as a company, and success as a nation. Then, lastly, we learn about building an ideal world based on both private happiness and public happiness. Private happiness and public happiness. So, I, uh, Master Yuho Okawa's uh, work, uh, lecture is uh, 60 minutes in total, but I divide it to, into few parts. So, let's start, watch the first part. It will last 24 minutes or so. Oh, sorry. Hello, everyone. This venue is long and narrow like an eel's burrow. It's a shame that I can't see you on the far right and left. I thought about walking around with a mic while I talk. This mic is fixed in place. It may be a bit inconvenient for those on the edges. But please focus with your ears or use one eye. Then you should be able to understand. I'm going to rotate my neck like a fan as I talk. It's my first time at a wide venue like this. My neck may get sore. It's been three years since I came here to Nagoya. I used to live here about three years ago. I was here for work. So it feels very nostalgic. Yesterday I arrived at Nagoya station. I looked around and noticed that the design of the station had changed completely. I heard they renovated it for the design expo, so it felt new. The last time I was in Nagoya, I sensed that people here were mainly interested in building a new culture. People seem to have a desire to create their own culture. I think the Design Expo was held as a part of that. But here's what I think. Even if you design the outward appearance, it will eventually change. However, once the human mind is designed, this design will never get old. It will continue to have an eternal, everlasting life. Once it is shaped, it will never fade away. I think so. We are living eternal lives. That's a theme I've been consistently teaching in my 70 or so books. I explain it like this. The fact is the fact. 
This is an uncompromising fact, and no evidence can overturn this fact. But we can offer various resources that support this fact. Each book I published is based on this single fact that humans have eternal life and are on the path of eternal soul training. I continue to publish books to reveal this fact. Today's lecture is titled New Developments and Success Theory. When I talk about the theory of success, I must think of us as beings that exist within the great never-ending river called eternal life. Without this perspective, we cannot define what success is. Some of you may think of success as being recognized in this world. After leading a highly admirable life for 60 or 70 years, and I don't think this is a success. Success must be considered from an eternal perspective. Having an eternal perspective is the starting point of living as humans. No matter how well a theory of success is built, it'll crumble easily by a small earthquake if it has the wrong starting point. 3,000 people are here today. Some of you may have read many of my books. Others may not have read any yet. Perhaps some of you are still skeptical. We have a diverse crowd. As you see me standing at the podium and speaking to you, if you feel even a trace of truth in my expression, appearance, or words, I promise all of you, I declare to all of you, humans have eternal life. This is 100% the truth. It is indisputable. Humans are created in this way. If we explore the depths of our minds, we will find that we've lived in various times and places. I've published many books of spiritual messages. These spiritual figures are those who had lived as great people in the past. If their lives had perished after they died, it would be impossible to publish books in the style of spiritual messages. But I'm doing it so daringly. If you feel I'm speaking the truth, it means it's the fact. What does that mean? All 3,000 of you here will leave this earth one day. You will eventually die, but your life will not perish. By imperishable life, I don't mean it in a Christian sense which says, if you do good and believe in the Son of God, you will have eternal life. If not, you will perish like how grass withers. All human beings, all lives, equally have value. You're all blessed with eternal life. Yet, how it is expressed differs depending on each person's thoughts and deeds. Your thoughts, motives, and actions produce results. These results are not limited to the life in this world. It will also affect you in the afterlife, how you will live in the world after death. On that premise, Today, I'd like to talk about the theory of success from a few frameworks. The frameworks of the individual, company, and nation. The 
I'll talk about it by roughly dividing the matter into these three levels. To start off, I'd like you to understand the following. Success theory I teach is different from the ones you often find on street corners. The ones that only teach a superficial embellished success or a success to show off. First of all, what is success on an individual level? Many people have probably thought about this. In a way, success is similar to the happiness we teach at Happy Science. If the word success incorporates the basic idea that humans live eternal lives, it should perfectly align with the idea of true happiness we teach. Now, what is the success that accords with true happiness? I'd like to state three points as the basic attitude we must have. The first point is this. To put it in an easy-to-understand way, if you have lived for several decades, but no one tells you, I'm glad you are here, then you are not successful. Thanks for being alive. Thanks for being alive in this era, in this region, in this place, in this time. Whether people express it in words or without words, if they didn't think, I'm glad you were alive. I'm glad our lives crossed. You were not successful. In other words, it would be the worst if others say to you, I wish you weren't born. It would mean you weren't worth being born. Your life on earth wasn't worth anything. The proof that you were alive might as well be erased. First, I'd like you to understand this point. To live a life in which people tell you, I'm glad you were alive. You must inevitably examine the content of your life. So what's the second point? It isn't a passive attitude, like the first point, but a more active one. It is about what you have left behind in this lifetime. Something positive, work, the proof of your efforts, achievements, monuments. Or memento that you can confirm for yourself. It mustn't be subjective. You must leave behind something that will be valued objectively. If you are a working man, you can achieve it through your work. Even for those who spend their lives as housewives, it is possible to build a utopia in their homes, a visible utopia. You can tell if it's a real utopia or not, by seeing the faces of your family members. Look at your children's faces, your husbands or your parents, and you should know. So the second point is to leave behind visible traces of your life.
Third point which shows you've succeeded as a person is to have your own philosophy. For many of you, it might be difficult to leave behind your philosophy in a book. But what is expected of you isn't so difficult. You don't have to write a research paper that others can objectively study. What I mean by philosophy is the lessons you have learned in life. Lessons you can confidently tell other people. For example, these are the lessons I grasp through my life of 50 or 70 years. I'm confident they will benefit people who will come after me. I want you to grasp such lessons. This may sound simple, but let me ask you, do you have your own philosophy now? If I asked you to talk about your philosophy, what would you say? Suppose you were asked, what lessons have you learned in your life? Can you tell them in clear, simple words that would be helpful to others? Philosophy isn't born out of the blue one day. It is something you must grasp through studying, contemplating, putting your learning into practice, and accumulating various experiences. Only what you have grasped, mastered, and engraved in your mind will become philosophy. Each of you can or should possess your own philosophy. Without it, I must say you didn't improve spiritually even a bit in this lifetime. We are given a large third-dimensional space and are living together with over 5 billion people in the same era. This means we are expected to accumulate experiences on this spaceship Earth. If you simply keep your experiences for yourself, only you will be satisfied. Rather than keeping them for yourself, you should share them as learning material for other people. I want you to engrave lessons in your mind. The lessons you've engraved in your mind may take form as teachings, advice, or guidance for others while you're still alive. Or they may not take form on earth during your lifetime but may prove beneficial in the world I call the real world after you pass away. Many spirits send down spiritual messages to earth through me. But the contents of their messages are not made of something hard, like bricks and concrete blocks. Each and every word of their teachings is a gem. It is their philosophy that has clearly gained brilliance through experience. They're sending you the light they themselves have gained. They're sending you powerful words of light. That's right. Just as things come in various sizes, so does enlightenment. Enlightenment has various levels. But as long as you are living as a human being with a name and personality, I want you to have your own unique and distinctive philosophy. Even if it is inferior to that of another person. When this philosophy is elevated, it is called enlightenment. That's right. The success in a person's life should contain their enlightenment. 
should tell their enlightenment. Should have the taste of enlightenment or the fragrance of enlightenment. It's true that enlightenment isn't something you can touch or show others. Just as fruit has its own fruity scent and a flower has its own flowery scent. Enlightenment of each one of you gives off the fragrance of your own soul. People can surely smell the difference. When you pass by a peach tree, you will smell peaches. When you pass by a cherry blossom tree, you will smell cherry blossoms. Likewise, the fragrance of each person's enlightenment gives passers-by its own distinct feeling and aftertaste and inspires their interest in that person. This cannot be denied just because it is unclear or unknown. Each person has a soul, which means they always emit the fragrance, the scent, rich and mellow smell of enlightenment. The total sum of this fragrance of enlightenment each person emits determines the tone of this world. If this smell is rotten, if this smell is unpleasant, or if this smell is impure, this world will become a dark, gloomy, and bad-smelling one no one would want to live in. But when a sweet fragrance fills the air, utopia will appear. It's not difficult to imagine this. I spoke about the three points of success based on personal enlightenment. This is a basic theory. I want you to understand this basic idea by applying it to your own life. To reiterate, the first step is not to burden other people. Instead of being disliked, be someone others will say, I'm glad you are here. The second step is making sure you did something in the several decades of life. Leave behind a clear, tangible legacy that enables you to say, I did this much. Thirdly, engrave life's lessons in your mind and develop them into your philosophy. When your philosophy is elevated, it'll be your enlightenment. It'll bear a fruit named enlightenment or a bloom of flower named enlightenment. Okay, this is the end of the first first part. Thank you, Master Lord. Okay, I'll give some comment on this part. Okay, uh, first important point is a prerequisite of the success in a happy science or the true sense. It is we are walking uh, the eternal path to God. We have given the eternal life, which means we are reincarnated from heavenly world to this world repeatedly, more than 100 times, 1,000 times, or 10,000 times we have an uh, eternal life. And uh, each eternal life, each uh, life on earth, uh, uh, okay, uh, you are, have three choices, three options. You can make a progress, and you can make a retreat, or you can may, you maybe stay put there. So making progress and making retreat or in the same place. Uh, please imagine you can you are going to walk on uh, 10,000 10, miles from today for a few years. And uh, if you, uh, you can walk in uh, five miles in a day, it's OK. 10 miles, it's OK. But if you are stay put, you cannot, no, no progress, you cannot reach the goal in any time. 
And also, it may, if we may go back, you cannot go, go to the goal. So how do you make progress in these lifetimes is very, very important. Each have, uh, each made some kind of progress or retreat or some kind of uh, uh, effect on that, that each life. Okay, uh, and this, yeah. next. Uh, in happy science, we teach us that uh, spiritual world is divided in uh, several layers from fourth dimensional world, fifth dimensional world, six, seven, eight, nine. Ninth dimension is a world of God of saviors. The usual heaven is called the fifth dimension. Most of us come from this world and also go back to this world, most of us. And uh, even though it is divided in this kind of uh, uh, several layers, but actually these layers are also divided into uh, more. Like uh, if you take a fifth dimensional Buddhist realm, it will be divided into three parts. Upper fifth dimensional realm, middle realm, and a lower realm. Though, so you, you are, uh, this realm is also divided in three parts. So each area, there are, some, uh, there are many souls are living. So their state of the mind is quite different. And, but it is not the end. Each realm, three realm, is divided into also three or more things like this. So uh, you might come from the middle, mid, uh, upper, uh, lower middle fifth dimension. If imagine if you come from lower middle fifth dimension, uh, dimension, and through this time, a lifetime, you made uh, some kind of a progress, and you can go to the mid uh, middle fifth di uh, dimensional world. When you come back, come back to the heaven, it is a success. Success. And if you can come go back to the upper fifth dimension, it's a great success, great success. But sometimes you might go, you might regress to the lower fifth dimension or even fourth dimension. That is a failure. So point is uh, how we can make a progress in this lifetime as a soul, making a soul, progress as a soul. It is the very much important thing. And the Master Ryuho Okawa pointed the three things as a personal success, as a personal success. First, we should be told by others that we are happy that you live with us. We are happy that you live uh, with us. That means you lived as a life of love. Your life was full of love to others. You made a giving love to others. So you're kind to others. So that's why uh, you are told that you are, you are, we are happy that you are here. But if you lived the love of uh, taking love from others, annoying others, uh, that means they don't like you. They don't like you. So this first point is about love, about love. Second point. Leave behind some tangible legacy or deed you can be proud of. That means you made some progress. You made some personal progress or progress in the society or like that. That is a second point. Then the last point is most important. Leave behind your own philosophy which benefits other people. You should have a philosophy of your life, of your self. That means you must accumulate wisdom and also practice self-reflection by learning wisdom through books or reading or studying also experience and also through meditation you can acquire uh, philosophy, wisdom. That is the most important thing. So, which means love, wisdom, uh, self-reflection, progress, these are the fourfold paths of happy science. So the fourfold path is a very way to, for us to become successful as a person. Please keep a uh, mind of that. Okay. And the master taught 
most important thing is about happy uh, about success as our individual is enlightenment enlightenment what is enlightenment each of you should have your own unique thought without it i must say you have no spiritual improvement in this life that i said about the spiritual growth I really want the world, su world success in your life must sound like uh, enlightenment in some way or another. You should have the content of enlightenment, the flavor of enlightenment, the fragrance of enlightenment. So in happy science, we should, uh, make we should uh, strive to become successful through uh, enlightenment. enlightenment. That is the most important part of master lecture. Then uh, we are going to the second part of master lecture. Now let us shift away from the framework of an individual. How would this theory of success be applied to a company or an organization? Please think about this. Today, Japan is filled with companies. These companies seem to be prospering. Japan seems to be enjoying unprecedented prosperity now. Foreign countries may be seeing Japan in this way. The system of companies fits today's society well, but it is heartless. This is the biggest defect. I said there is no heart. Can companies have a heart? Some people may question this. If the word heart is unfitting, you could call it spirit or a mindset. It means a company mission. There are articles of incorporation, and the business objective is profit. Chasing profit is fine, but what is it for? What is in the minds of people who seek out profit? What exactly is the company's objective? What are they seeking? Have you ever asked these questions? That's what I'm asking. These things are taught to new employees during orientation. A company has a business objective, and its goal is to make a profit. That's fine. I'm not saying money is evil. Money is a great power if used positively. It can make this world a better place. But you must know that profit is essentially neutral in value. Profit itself is neither good nor evil. Whether it's good or evil is determined by the mindset and motive of the person who uses it and its outcome. Without knowing this, it's no use increasing just the figures. From the spiritual eye, profits spent in good ways are shown in black. While profits spent in bad ways are shown in red. Even if the balance shows a surplus on paper, if profits are truly used to make this world better or to create utopia, they aren't actually written in black ink, but in golden ink. That's how they appear on the balance sheets and income statements. Viewed spiritually, it's written in golden ink. Otherwise, they are written in red, black, or gray. That's how it is. Without considering this, you won't know if your company's development and prosperity are true and real. 
Even if your company prospers, it is no different from the dead leaves on the riverside. If it disrupts this world and people's lives and destroys their environment and minds, what then is important? It is the mindset of the company's leader. From now on, leaders aren't allowed to be leaders without knowing about the mind or the world of the mind. Those of you who have never trained your mind, leave management immediately. I dare say so. Management isn't just about ability. Of course, competence itself is a way to give love to others. It allows you to serve the community. However, if you work for your own gain or to be recognized and rewarded, or if your motive is to benefit yourself, and I must say you have no heart, the word virtue is often used. In this context, virtue is a requirement to become a manager or leader. But virtue has also become an outdated word. It's becoming harder to understand it nowadays. Yet virtue definitely exists. Let me explain it to you in simple words. A virtuous person is someone who uses the majority of their life's time to think about other people's happiness. Now, all of you, look within your minds. What did you think about during these decades? Wasn't it mainly about yourself? Think about your day out of 24 hours. You're awake 16 hours. What are you thinking about during those hours? Isn't it mostly about yourself? Aren't you only worried about your personal concerns? Even if you sometimes think of others, aren't you thinking about their bad points? Aren't you full of complaints, criticism, and reproaches? Aren't you always blaming others or your environment? Such people lack virtue. The virtuous person continues to think about others for the love of other people. In this world, we can't tell what's inside a person's mind. Unfortunately, we can't see others' thoughts as if looking through glass, which is what minds are like in the afterworld. We can't see it now. But what you've kept thinking in your mind surely appears as the light of your soul. This is virtue. Virtue cannot be taken out and shown. But how much time did you spend thinking about love for other people without considering your benefit or the desire for fame or self-preservation? Did you spend your time wishing to make other people happy? The total amount of such time will manifest as virtue. In my book, Rojin, I explain that the light of enlightenment leaks from you. Likewise, light surely seeps from the mind, although it is not visible like glass and is covered by the physical body in this third-dimensional world. It leaks just like the light emanating from a silkworm cocoon. This is virtue. How much did you think about others? How much did you think about others to nurture, forgive, and cherish them? This is virtue. This is the conclusion for those of you who have no idea what virtue is. Virtue can be explained in many ways. This is the simplest way. 
Fill your mind with love for others. Know that love and virtue are very much akin to each other. The process of virtue growing into a large gem is similar to oysters making pearls. The process of this pearl becoming larger is very similar to the developmental stages of love which are taught in the laws of the sun. To become a virtuous person, start by giving love to others. It's not a give and take, just give love. I named it fundamental love. In the process of giving love, talented people who have developed more skills can practice nurturing love. I teach this too. Nurturing love is a leader's love. It is love that teaches and guides others. This stage of love is above the stage of simply giving love. I said many leaders of the world, too, practice this love. I also said that a more difficult one than this love is the stage of forgiving love. Outstanding people can practice nurturing love. They can see both strengths and flaws of others. At the same time, they also develop an acute sense of what's inferior and superior. So they start picking out others' flaws. Most executives are stuck here. The stage of nurturing love, they see people's flaws too clearly. They pick up on their subordinates' mistakes and weak points too much. Then, like Machiavelli who wrote The Prince, they start to treat people like objects or machines, just to protect their organizational body called company. They develop a cold heart in this way. To overcome this, you need forgiving love toward other people. Forgiving love is a kind love. It is a feeling of kindness. It is love that wishes to forgive other sins, mistakes and faults, and embrace them, based on the view that they too were created by God and were given life much like you were. This love arises when your mind has elevated to a religious state. I then stated that above this is love incarnate, the love of yet a greater leader or a great figure. It is the love of someone who becomes the ethos of the age. Their very presence in the time is a gospel to humanity. Such an ethos exists in any time and in any region. They emit light in all directions. Their love is not one-on-one -on -one or aimed at something, they're just shining. Like Edison's light bulb, they keep on shining. I call such love, love incarnate. These developmental stages of love are the same as the stages of virtue growing. If I were to point out a difference, love manifests in actions. Love manifests in people's activities. Love is born between people. Love appears in relationships between people. Thoughts will take form and manifest in a visible way through actions or activities. And we call this function love. On the other hand, virtue has an emphasis on existence itself rather than action or activity. Virtue is the profound wisdom that is stored in your mind. When love sublimates and crystallizes into a gem, it becomes virtue. This virtue is only partly used. Just like a crystal ball, you can see through it beautifully. But you can never touch the inside of it. You can touch the surface, but not the inside. 
You can see through the inside but can't touch it. Virtue is like this crystal ball. Anyone can see it if they try, but they can't touch it. They can't touch it with their hands. This is virtue. Virtue is the existence. We are now in the second part, yeah? Uh, uh, we are seeking the success as a company and which will be based on the virtue. What is virtue? Virtue, it's very difficult, okay? I, and uh, Master Liu Hoka taught virtue on the, in the context of Chinese philosophy, which is studied by Confucius, I think. But the source of the Confucius thought is also coming from Ame no Miyagami, which is the father god of Japan, which is a part of Elkantara. So it's also his, his own thought. Then what is virtue? What is virtue? Okay. There are many explanations about virtue, but uh, the virtuous person, a person of virtue is the one who always think about happiness of many people, not only his own happiness, but also family, uh, friends, uh, company people, the customers, and all the people in the country. That is a virtuous person. So it's very nearly to, uh, it's close to relation to, have, uh, to love, love, teaching of love. And uh, total amount of love you gave to others manifest as the light of your soul. That is called virtue. Total amount of your love you gave to others from your birth to this day will become accumulated as a virtue, the light of your soul. This virtue. The second explanation. And then, virtue is wisdom stored in the heart. It shines like a crystal ball. Another explanation. Okay. Then, uh, in other explanation, uh, Master taught us the virtue is consist of wisdom, benevolence, benevolence which is near to love, and courage. Wisdom, benevolence, and courage are the are the ele uh, element of virtue. Without one of them, without one, uh, you cannot be a virtuous person. We need all three of them. When we create this kind of uh, factor in you, it is. Called a, you are called a virtuous person in some extent. Okay. Uh, and uh, Master taught us about the relationship with uh, the relationship between virtue and love. Uh, in happy science, we are taught about the uh, uh, de developmental stage of love, which start on fundamental love, nurturing love. Uh, forgiving love, which is kind of higher, very high, and then love incarnate, love incarnate, each of which is related to spiritual level, like fourth dimensional, fifth dimensional, six, seven, eight. Okay, fundamental love corresponds to the fifth dimensional world, which is sometimes called a neighboring love, which Jesus Christ taught us. Okay, so as you have become as your life becomes higher level, your virtue will grow bigger. And, uh, uh, okay, it's, uh, okay, Master taught us, your, as your love becomes greater or virtue becomes greater, you can, you can lead uh, more people, more people. 
you can become a bigger leader. So in the fundamental love level, you may be the leader of the few people, like the family. You may be the family leader if you are a person of fundamental love. But if you develop the nurturing love with uh, accumulated knowledge, you'll be a leader of the, okay, dozens of people, at least. You can be a leader of dozens of people. In order to become the leader of the hundreds of people like that, you need some kind of forgiving love because you have to deal with many different people. Some people you like, some people you don't like, even though you must manage them and also nurture them. So in that case, you need some kind of forgiveness in your mind. So, and when your company become bigger and bigger, like thousands or tens of thousands, even more, uh, you need more virtue. In that case, some kind of love incarnate. So in that case, you can have some kind of a, a, a okay, a theory or wisdom or ethos of the age. Some you can have, you should have some kind of a great philosophy to lead the company or lead the nation, lead the people. Uh, okay. We can, I can imagine, I can make, think of some such kind of leader like uh, Henry Ford, which started the Ford Motor and a uh, great success. Also Bill Gates and uh, Steve Jobs are the people in the modern age that started the new era. These are the kind of uh, incar uh, love incarnate. But I don't say they are the Tathagata like people, but they have some kind of, a, uh, some kind of a quality like that. Okay, I believe so. So as you, as I said, as you grow, as your virtue become greater, you can lead, you can manage more people. You can make other, more people happier, happier. Okay, that's the conclusion of this part. Then we are going to the next part of master lecture. Sate. I've talked about the kind of leaders we need on the company level and how leaders should have virtue. Naturally, this level of discussion should apply to the national level as well. Right now, we happen to be in election season. Japan's politics is at a major turning point. And it's becoming more difficult to know which direction to head toward in the future. If you don't know where to head, don't ask your own little brains. Don't look to other countries for a role model. You must seek God's will or God's thoughts. How does Japan look from God's eye? Where should Japanese politics head to? This must be discussed more seriously. Political parties mustn't just compete for the number of votes or seats in the diet. You must think more seriously. Political issues and corruption boil down to one point. Politics lack virtue. Politicians lack virtue. A lack of virtue means you can't see where God is heading. It means you don't know the true direction. It means you don't know the direction of true righteousness. This is it. Without knowing the true direction, politicians are striving in their own way. But in the eyes of the many citizens who aren't working in politics, such politicians appear to be living egotistically for their own benefit, with a competitive, selfish mind. If they had virtue and could see the direction of God, their efforts would be justly rewarded and appreciated. But because they lack depth, they seem to be working for self-preservation, self-interest, 
or their own power. That may not be their true aim, but the fact that it seems that way means they have lost sight of the essence or the North Star. Now, Japan is entering a great turning point. The next 10 years, until the year 2000, will be a great turning point for Japan's future. Many things will happen in the next decade. There may be chaos. However, beyond the chaos, we must aim at achieving one goal to return politics to the hands of those who deserve it. In other words, to reflect the order and mission of the real world in politics. There's no other goal. There are several ways to achieve this. Take, for example, today's parliamentary system. I don't think the two political institutions, the House of Representatives and the House of Councillors, are functioning. I don't think the House of Councillors is necessary. Why? It exists to act as the conscience of the legislature so that good, insightful people can prevent the government from going astray. But they're not functioning in this way. I don't think the counselors are capable of sound judgment either. They only duplicate the legislative process and are inviting delays and inefficiencies in national politics. Moreover, the concept of democracy is misunderstood for electoral democracy. This is also a big mistake. Electoral democracy isn't highly evaluated from a grander viewpoint. It can prevent the worst and raise politics to a certain level. But the ideal form of politics has never been realized through electoral democracy. Why is that? It's because the very process of finding virtuous people repels competition for interest and power. It doesn't align with the principle of competition. Virtuous people are naturally chosen. They emerge naturally. That's the way it is. Virtue shouldn't be jumbled and stirred up like shards of glass. The system should allow for the virtuous person to be chosen naturally. Truly virtuous people cannot emerge under today's election system. You may understand the major reasons for this. One reason is it costs money. It's also a very unstable profession. Maybe the awareness of other politicians is at an intolerable level. There are many reasons. However, we must be courageous and reform the system in the coming age. There are several ways to reform it. At this point in time, I'd recommend the following. Divide the House of Representatives into three groups. If it consists of 600 Diet members, for example, then one-third or 200 of them should be trained as political experts. Politicians can't truly lead the nation if they must work to win the election every two, three, or four years. There's a flood of information today, and we need experts in every profession. I don't think such short-lived politicians have the ability to lead the bureaucrats or lead the opinions of foreign countries in a good direction. If we want great achievements as a country, experts are needed in politics. 
At least one-third or 200 people should be trained as experts in politics. It doesn't have to be a certification test like the one graduates-to-be will take. People with over five years of real-world experience can take a national test for politicians and be certified. It would test one's expertise on politics, economics, and law. But that alone would be the same as the current system of selecting bureaucrats. So in addition, I strongly recommend the truth or the teachings of the mind. We want to elect people who studied this. We want to elect those who studied both specialized knowledge and the truth and nurture them as political experts. To remove the wrong people, a national review could be held every 10 years like the Supreme Court judges. If they pass, they can serve until they retire at age 60. This is crucial in leading the country. Now, for the next one-third or the next 200, I propose vocation-based democracy, or democracy by industry, to replace the current House of Councillors. There are various groupings for each industry now. For example, the banking industry has the Bankers Association. The head of some city bank becomes chair of the Bankers Association. There are many industries like banking, manufacturing, steel, machinery, or oil. So every four years, each group could select one diet member among those who have experience being at the top of the industry. They can vote among themselves. There's no re-election if they fully serve their term. It's important for each industry to send their leaders in turn as diet members. This system can replace the House of Councillors. These members can belong to any political party under their term. So they don't represent the interests of any group. Once being selected from their industry, they can freely choose their party. Their term is four years. The remaining 200 will be chosen by an election. Every four years, about 100 members, two from each prefecture, will be elected locally. And the remaining 100 members will be elected nationally. So there are three groups. Professional politicians, industry-based politicians, and elected politicians. Each group can select one candidate for the position of prime minister. A national referendum is held to elect the prime minister out of these three. This style will allow us to select the best person from various groups. I recommend this system for the present age. Political instability can be avoided by having professional politicians, and high competence can be ensured by choosing people who succeeded in business. New blood can be brought in by holding elections for some seats. I think this is the desirable style. There's one more thing I must say now. Currently, the tax system is an issue. Japan's tax system has clearly reached a point where it is wrong in the eyes of God. It is wrong. It really is. Taxation shouldn't be like this. In God's country, only a 10% tax is acceptable. 10% from individuals and 10% from companies. No more than that. This is the rule that has been established over a long period of time. Now some individuals are taxed over 50% and high taxes are taken from companies. High-income earners have lost the will to work. Businesses have created extra work to save on taxes. 
leaving them less time to work on business development. This is a waste. Don't tax more than 10%. Think within this range. If the revenue is limited, it's clear what to do. Spend within the range. What should the government do if they need more? The Ministry of Finance can distribute money to each ministry out of the 10% tax. But if ministries want to spend more, they should provide services on their own and receive money in exchange. A company's logic must be incorporated. They should earn money for their services if they want to spend more. Unnecessary services will be eliminated. If citizens find no economic value in their services, they'll be unnecessary. Many services are useless now. Think about it. They do lots of useless work. Unnecessary services will be completely eliminated, while useful services will generate money. Each ministry can raise income by providing good services and making citizens happy. In this way, they should budget and operate within its own income. Another fundamental mistake is that a budget must be used up within a year or the following year at the latest. Does such a thing work in households or businesses? Do you spend it all? Does it ever work? What if you need to pay a tuition fee or medical bills? What if the economy slides into a recession? Naturally, companies will retain earnings if there's enough profit. But the government doesn't. They spend it all because otherwise they can't gain next year's budget. That's why there's much road work near fiscal year end. It's ridiculous. You're laughing, but it's unacceptable. Each ministry could be independent, should store money, and spend it on critical projects every five to ten years. If there's money left, they can invest it. Don't you agree? What's more, there are many unnecessary government agencies. I'm sorry if you work there. For example, the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries is not necessary. It should be privatized. The amount of agricultural subsidy equals that of income tax on salary. They need a company's logic. The Ministry of Transport, what's it for? Railways are no longer run by the government. The Ministry of Post and Telecommunications, Private delivery services have developed, so we don't need national postal services. Having a banking agency in the post office is strange, too, because the Ministry of Finance is also collecting money. It should be integrated into the Ministry of Finance to be a state-run bank. If they're short on tax revenue, they should make a profit by investing the money they've collected. They must make an effort to fund the budget themselves. They fail to do this now. Another one is the Ministry of Education. The Center to make guidelines for education is fine, but the rest is unnecessary. The Ministry of Health and Welfare, I'm not sure why it exists. Medical insurance premiums are virtually a tax. They can't tax further, so they take money that way. The Ministries of Foreign Affairs, International Trade and Industry, Home Affairs, and part of the Ministry of Finance may remain. Other ministries should be downgraded to bureaus or small agencies. Then fewer taxes will be needed. Banks have made great progress after World War II, protected by the Ministry of Finance. As a result, city banks are making hundreds of billions of yen in ordinary income. Is that acceptable? Are they allowed to make such profits under governmental protection? It's wrong based on the company's logic. 
If profits are that high, product prices must go down. Loan interest rates must be lowered. But the ministry protects the banks by setting the same interest rate for all. It's wrong. If banks receive such guidance from the Ministry of Finance, they must pay a fee out of their profit, like taxes. If not, they must compete freely in a financial deregulation environment. Some banks may become financially weak by doing so, but so do other companies. They must streamline their management and offer people low-priced services. Such protection is wrong. Having passed the post-war period of development, it's unnecessary now. There's a lot of waste, yet the government leaves it and creates more taxes. This kind of world is wrong. Taxes must be 10%. They must earn through services and spend within the range. Living within your means is crucial for individuals, too. You must save part of your income. This will build economic power and yield prosperity like accumulated virtue. This is true at a national level as well. This is the end of the sad part. Okay. Okay, Master Rihoka taught about a uh, Japanese political system. Uh, some may be uh, irrelevant, uh, but uh, uh, basically the principles are kind of applied to the Australia and other countries too, I suppose. Here I put the four point, four points. Uh, selection system that naturally choose the virtuous leaders. That is very, very important part, but it's difficult. Uh, okay, uh, how can we uh, choose the Virtuous leaders, it's very difficult. Yeah, it's a kind of big, big uh, problem. Okay, master's idea is a one way of doing that. Then, 10 percent succession from the individual and from companies. It's a very, very basic idea, most important idea. And the uh, budget system that accumulates surplus for the future needs, budget system that accumulate surplus for the future needs. Then, finally, abolish unnecessary government agencies, abolish unnecessary government agencies. Uh, in total, uh, the uh, kind of un, uh, basic idea is that we shouldn't have big government, big government. We should have Small government. Big government, big government is means a uh, high tax rate. Rate. Japan, Australia is also high tax. United States too. Big tax. It's a, it's a big government symbol mark. Then, small elite control everything. The bureaucratic agency is very very strong. Control. They want want to control everything. That is a big government. Also. Social welfare system from cradle to the grave, that kind of thing happened in the United Kingdom and also in here. I'm not sure about that. So we are kind of weak people protected by the government that is near to totalitarianism. So people become weaker and weaker in this kind of government system. That is not the utopia we are seeking. So we need to have a smaller government smaller government, low tax rate, and also we should have a freedom and uh, take responsibility for our own lives, responsibility. And also we need some minimum safety net, safety net, that is the minimum should be. And uh, seek the prosperity based on freedom. That is the ideal society we are seeking. That is why, because we all children God or children Buddha. So we are originally uh, strong people that you might think, uh, that, that you might think, but we are actually, we have a great power within us. So we should use that power and create better society with our own effort, freedom, and also wisdom. Okay, this is the part we are think seeking.
Then comes the last part of master lecture. You must question the matters that are taken for granted. We are aiming to build utopia in the name of truth. This is not limited to the world of the mind. If there's something wrong with the social system, we must point it out. Listen carefully. What does it mean for the place you live or the world to become better? It means you must be happier and happier year after year. Otherwise, we can't say we are on the path to becoming a first-rate country. The value of truth should work on economic and political levels as well. It must work to increase people's happiness. So why do you stay silent? Why do you remain still? We must conduct various activities under the single idea of happiness. We should not just complain. We should not just criticize for the sake of criticizing. We need the world to be as it should be. We need utopia. Therefore, from this day on, please have two goals. I want you to have two clear goals. What is the first goal? It is called the pursuit of private happiness. Don't mistake this for egotism. Pursuit of private happiness is the pursuit of enlightenment or the pursuit of happiness that comes with enlightenment. It is to experience how your enlightenment affects other people. Enhancing your sense of happiness based on a higher level of enlightenment. This is the pursuit of private happiness, which is a basic theory of happy science. The other is the pursuit of public happiness, which I haven't talked much about until now. Don't think about yourself only. Don't think about your spiritual happiness only. Open your eyes more and think about the happiness of others. Think about the happiness of people in your community and nation. Don't be hands off. Keep a sharp eye out, learn and experience many things. Voice your opinions and act to make the world better. This is the basic starting point, too. Utopia will not be born unless you yourself take action. Don't blame other people, the times, or your country for the lack of utopia. If Japan is not a good place to live, if it worsens year after year, it means each person isn't making an effort. We won't settle for personal happiness only. We'll create an ideal world based on private and public happiness. Creating an ideal world is our final goal. We'll work hard, so please help us. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so uh, this part is very important. We are not only seeking private, private happiness, but also public happiness, which means the happiness of society, happiness as an organization, happiness as a country, and happiness as a world. So we are seeking personal happiness and uh, public happiness together private happiness and public happiness together, through which both of, with both of them, we can build a utopia world, utopia world. And uh, traditional religions like Buddhism and uh, uh, Christianity, uh, Muslim, or these are mostly focused on the private happiness, private happiness. Mostly the teaching is more than 90% of the teaching is consists of uh, private uh, related to private happiness, but in happy science, uh, from this time uh, it was 1989. From that time on, Master Rifukawa started to teach about corporate management, 
or the happiness of the, the company or uh, co corporation also started to talk, uh, teach about the uh, government policies, also international economy and uh, uh, international politics. So we have many, many teaching about public happiness too, because Master Ryuko Okawa is uh, responsible for creating a utopia, not only in a small world, but also the whole, whole this uh, earth. That's why he teaches us. So we don't seek your happiness. We, you don't seek your happiness only. You have to seek the happiness as a country, as an organization, also as a world. That is a mission. That is a happy science. So, okay. This is the conclusion of today's lecture and my comment. And then we will wrap up this uh, uh, Sunday service by reciting the prayer to El Cantare, which is a prayer book, the white prayer book at the back of this room. If you can recite together. Prayer to El Cantare. Lord El Cantare, you are our Lord, Buddha and Savior. We believe you are the master of masters, the highest God of this planet Earth. We believe you have the supreme power, both in heaven and on Earth. You are the great spiritual being, united consciousness of Buddha and God. Lord El Cantare, we believe you will lead all people to true happiness. We believe the fourfold path of love, wisdom, self-reflection, and progress perfects the principles of happiness. But we truly believe these principles will save the entire world. O oh Lord, please grant us the holy mission to spread the truth all over the world. We will cross the vast oceans, the lighter beacon of truth in every corner of the world. O oh Lord, please entrust us with your great vow to save all humankind. We will devote our lives to creating Buddha and Utopia. Lord El Cantare, as long as you are in heaven and your disciples are on earth, we will hand down a mission to future generations, achieve your great vow. We, the disciples of El Cantare, will join together to become the ship of your great vow to save the people and bring them the show of enlightenment. O oh Lord, we thank you very much for granting us a prayer to El Cantare. Uh, this concludes today's Sunday service. Thank you for joining. Thank you for coming and thank you for joining online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jay, thank you. Ah, uh, uh, Ali. <laughs> thank you, Suzuki san. It was wonderful. Ah, thank you. Oh, Brian, oh, thank you.